Welcome to the Mount Zion AME Zion Church Worship Experience, where the Reverend Dr. Claude A. Schufert serves as the pastor. We pray that this worship experience will be a tremendous blessing to you as you're reminded of God's unwavering love for us all as we continue to trust his written word to guide us and unapologetically praise his holy name. We greet you this morning everywhere with the joy of Jesus from the Mount Zion AME Zion Church at 455 West Fred Gray Avenue in Montgomery, Alabama where the Reverend Claude A. Schufert is our pastor. This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it for God is our rock, God is our hope, and God is our stay. Let us pray. This is your day, O oh God. Thank you for the privilege of another day in which we adore you and magnify you and glorify your name. For you are great and you are worthy to be praised. Because this is your place of worship, O oh God, in our hearts. Rest today and have your way as only you know how. We thank you for what you are about to do in us, for us, and through us today. In the precious name of Jesus, who is the Christ, and the people of God everywhere said together, Amen, Amen, and Amen. If you will, stand all over the place or wherever you are and join us in our hymn of praise, hymn number 648, Marching to Zion.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, O oh God, for this day. We thank you, O oh God, just for how you have waking us up this morning and started us along our way. We thank you, O oh God, for bringing us into this place, O oh Lord. We magnify you, O oh God, and we worship you this morning. We reverence you this morning, O oh God, and we recognize your greatness, O oh God. We thank you, good Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And we thank you, Father God, for your awesome power. We thank you, O oh God, for your victorious right hand that lays on us and rests on us. Rests on us. We ask, O oh God, that you would look into our hearts and that you would bless our needs this morning, God. We ask, Father God, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, O oh God, to cast our cares onto you, Father. You promise us, God, in your word that as we cast our cares on you, you would give us rest. We ask, O oh God, that you would restore us this morning, that you would renew us this morning, God, that you would feed us, O oh God, that you would shine your face upon us, O oh God. We ask, O oh God, for your healing this morning. We ask, Father God, and we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning, your word to break and to release, Father God, your word that heals, Father God. We ask, O oh God, right now in the name of Jesus, that you would come into this place, oh God. That you would touch our minds, Father God, right now, Lord. We ask, Father God, that you would give us peace. We ask, Father God, for those who are hurting right now, Lord, that you would be a comforter, that you would be a healer, Father God, in the name of Jesus. We won't forget the many things that you've done for us and the things, oh God, that you will continue to do for us right now, God. And we thank you, Lord. As the Sunday school lesson taught us this morning that when you bless us, God, we worship you. We magnify you, God, and we reverence you, Father. We consult you first, oh God. And we thank you, Father, God, for working all things out for our good. In the name of Jesus, pray. Amen. <laughs>
people of God said amen. amen. Somebody just shout, he is precious. He is precious. Hallelujah, his name is precious. Father, we thank you today for the preciousness of your name. And for the privilege to always be under the authority of your name. By your name we are saved, we were saved, and are saved. In your name we have victory over the devil, the world, and the flesh. Yes, and over death and the grave. Demons tremble at your name. We have access to our God and Father in your name. Your name is so very, very, very precious to us. We understand that there are no equivalents. No name like your name. And we thank you today that you brought us into the knowledge, the realization of the magnificence, the powerfulness of your name. Thank you for that day that you made us aware of you, whatever it was. For some, maybe 80 years ago, or 10 years ago, or somewhere in between. One day, you brought us to the revelation of who you are. And today again, we thank you for causing us not just to be cognizant, but to yield and to cry out, save us. I ask you as always, bless us while I stand to preach your gospel. For it is your word. And I'm only standing because you called me. So save the lost. Reclaim the backsliders. Edify your saints. Heal the sick as you have been doing. Release the captives. Comfort the bereaved. Fill the empty with yourself. Resurrected to death in our midst. And with the resurrection anointing, make preaching easy today. For you called me to this ministry. Again, in the company of the children of God and the angels that attend, I give you thanks. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The scripture text read in your hearing was from Jeremiah chapter 29 and I am going to read a couple of verses prior to uh, the selected text that Reverend Jones read in your hearing. I want to read the first and second verses of that Jeremiah 29 text. And before I read it, you've got to know that in chapter 28, uh, Hananiah has prophesied something falsely and has misinformed the children of God of their future, their present and future state. 
And so when you get to chapter 29 of Jeremiah, you're reading actually a letter that the true prophet Jeremiah read, all right, wrote in a letter to get God's people straightened out from the false information they had received from Hananiah in chapter 28. And so I just want to read uh, the first two verses and I'll come back uh, hopefully and uh, expound on this in a way that you will understand. Verse one, Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This was after King Jehoiachin, uh, the queen's mother, the court officials, the other officials of Judah, and all the craftsmen and artisans had been deported to Jerusalem. I don't know if you remember the passage Reverend Jones read in your hearing, but I'll refer to it in the sermon. I want to preach from the subject until your change comes. Until your change comes. The children of Israel were now exiled from Jerusalem into Babylon. And I may say the children of Israel, please remember that Israel has now been divided. The northern kingdom is really the one called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. They've been deported into Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar. It appeared that Babylon had won temporarily because after Nebuchadnezzar comes his son, Belshazzar, and he too was an evil man of Babylon. God's chosen people were now in a foreign land with strange gods, strange diets, strange cultures, strange laws, strange religious practices. And they were not accustomed to what they were now experiencing. The prophet Hananiah had said to them, you will only be there two years. And Jeremiah said to him, you uh, have prophesied falsely when you read the whole story and God is going to judge you for your false prophecies and you will die this year and he did, Ananiah. But God, because of Judah's sins, allowed them to go into exile. And you got to think about God as the all-powerful God that he is would allow his children to be conquered by evil folks and then take them off as if they are worse than the nation of Babylon. It's a rather perplexing thing until you uh, read prior to the text that God had always said to his chosen people, you can't act like other folks. Uh, he had said to them, if you forsake my laws and forsake me, I will allow your enemies to hold you captive. And thus he fulfilled the passage uh, again in this text unlike the Sunday school lesson today from 2 Chronicles chapter 20 when King Jehoshaphat and Judah 
uh, were being attacked by the nations of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, Jehoshaphat said to God, uh, we have obeyed you. We've done what you told us to do. You told us to spare Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and now they are attacking us. And because we have obeyed you, this is what the king said to God in fasting and prayer and sackcloth. He said to God, our eyes are on you now. It's up to you to get us out of this mess. But we like singing, the battle is not yours, but sometimes the battle is yours because it's your mess. Come on. That's in the Sunday school. But in the text, the mess was the children of God's battle. It was not the Lord's battle. It was their battle because unlike King Jehoshaphat and Judah, Jehoiakim and Judah had forsaken the Lord and so with King Zedekiah. So God allowed their enemies to take them out of their land that God had given them and put them subjugation, if you will, in a foreign land. Now, that sounds bad, doesn't it? Well, it was bad. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to be subservient, uh, treated as perhaps a slave, or be captive, even though the, the historians that say that they had much liberty uh, in Babylon, who wants to be out of their homeland uh, forced to be out it's different if you just want to travel but you're forced to be out of your homeland away from the true worshipers of God uh, somebody said regardless of what happened Lord please don't ever let me be away from people who believe in you and who know you I can live in different places but I want to be around somebody that's also praying to the same Jesus that I'm praying to that knows the preciousness of his name. And so they are in Babylon and, and God said to them uh, through Jeremiah, that's what you're going, that's where you're going to be for a while. You know you can't always just walk out of a bad situation. Come on, help me preach this sermon. It doesn't always change overnight. Or in the case of King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, it changed the same day. God said to them, you just go out tomorrow and face them. You don't have to fight them. Uh, in another case with uh, the king and uh, the prophet Elisha, God, he said to Elisha the prophet, tomorrow we're going to be able to buy food very cheap. And God can change it overnight. And of course, the king's right hand man, the Bible says, was leaning on the king. This is 2 King. He's leaning on the king. And he said, Oh, if God opened the windows of heaven, that's not going to happen on tomorrow. And the prophet Elisha looked at him and said, It will happen tomorrow, but you will not taste the food because you will die tomorrow. And you know the end of that story. Uh, it was cheap the next day. And the king appointed his servant, his right hand man, to supervise it. And as he was going to supervise, the folk were so excited, they ran over him. And they just kept stepping on him until he died. He got a chance to see it, like the prophet said, but he didn't get a chance to eat anything. And so you just got to know whenever God is saying something, uh, how many of you know whenever God says God means what he says? Now, I'm coming back to that in a minute. So what happens when you can't have an overnight turnaround or change today from a bad situation until your change comes? Here's number one. God said to them, I'm not putting these in my word, make the most of where you are. Make the most of where you are. You can't always have it over now. I know people like to say that, uh, you know, as if it's going to happen always just like that. Everybody likes it like that. Don't you like it like that? I love it when God just does it in a hurry. 
But I learned in life, life teaches you some things. You can be on the Lord's side and serving the Lord, and sometimes it appears that God is moving like a snail. <laughs> you know how a snail moves, right? Yeah, it looks like he's not moving at all. He's so slow. It's kind of kind of like uh, Reverend Lee Chester Washington told the story about uh, uh, it, some animal and and the snail and said when the animal took off and he noticed the snail wasn't anywhere near him, so he went back and said, "Are you ever going to move?" He said, "If you keep talking to me, I won't go anywhere." And sometimes God appears like he's not going anywhere or coming anywhere. He's as slow as it seems he can be. But what God said to Israel was, I'm not turning around fast. Make the most of where you are. That's big. Now I'm coming, I'll give you the text. Maybe you are not where you want to be. Turn to somebody and tell them, make the most of where you are. Or maybe you are in a bad place. God allows us to be in bad places sometimes. Make the most. Everybody shout it. Make the most of where you are. Or maybe your dreams are unfulfilled. Or maybe your dreams have been shattered. Or maybe your vision for your life has not been actualized. It didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out, God says. But make the most where you are. Can't sit around crying all the time. Can't sit around talking about how difficult it is all of the time. Whatever the case is, we've got to make the most of where we are in the kingdom. God told his people, this is how he told them to make the most. He said, go ahead and live. You're going, you're in Babylon. I'm not getting you out for 70 years. He said, but make the most of where you are. He said, where did he say that? Because he told them, build you some houses to live in. Plant you some vineyards and, and, and eat from it. And, and have children and give your children in marriage. Make the most of where you are and seek the welfare of Babylon and pray for the city. Because as the city goes and prospers, you will prosper in the city. That's the same thing as God saying to them, make the most of where you are. Do you know folk who never sing any songs except blues? You, you can't be blue all the time. Come on. Come on. You know, I like B.B. King, but you can't be blue all the time. Oh, yeah, I wish I could hear him play his guitar now. I, I like B.B. You, you can't sing the blues all the time. You're going to drive your folk away. They don't want to be around you. Nobody wants to be around you crying all the time. Let the church say amen. Have some good news for me sometimes. Call me some good news. I've got a, a dear cousin who's like a sister. She calls and says, oh, I, I called because I got some good news for you now. She said, like, she said I'm all, I know I always have to bring you bad news because you, you're the pastor in the family, but I got good news for you. I said, ooh, I was so glad to hear you say that because I saw your number. <laughs> and, and because it's not that she's doing badly to report to me. She just has, you know, when you got all these hundreds and hundreds of folks in your family, somebody's always sick, somebody's always got a disease, somebody's always dying, somebody's always getting locked up in jail, somebody's always doing something stupid. So, you know, she's my reporter. And God, she just like the news. Most of it is bad. <laughs> And so it's good when she calls and says, immediately, I've got good news. God said to the saints, you can't weep all the time. You've got to make the most of where you are.
A young man said to me, a young preacher who doesn't know my story said to me one day, he said, oh, you got it made. You at Mount Zion, you don't know what we going through. Now, I just relish when they talk to me like that. I can't help it. Because they're, they're espousing things out of their ignorance. So I just, as a, as a teacher preaches, I just let them go on. I give them some time then. They say, I give them a long rope. And when they finish, I say to them, how many outdoor toilets have you built for the church? And have you ever had to preach in your top coat with your robe on top of your top coat? And understand that I drove 85 miles one way to get to my church and 75 to the other one and 60 to the other one. Have you done that too? And know that I didn't always get paid. I just labored because God called me to preach. And I was glad to do what God called me to do. And so, so we can sing sad songs or we can make the most of where we are. Turn to somebody and tell them, make the most of where you are. It's not all bad. Things don't always go well. Things don't always fall in place when you want to. But how many of you know you're a child of God? In due season, the Bible says, you will reap if you faint not. So if you're working for the master, work hard. Make the most of it. If you're giving your best, give your best. Do it with joy and do it in faith and do it understanding that reaping season is coming after a while. Hallelujah. So make the most of wherever you are. Listen, uh, one of the great lines in, in one of uh, Tyler Perry's movie, and I'm going to the second thing, uh, the lady looked at her friend and said, it's the, it's the movie entitled A Family That Prays, P-R-E-Y is it says are you living or are you just existing turn to somebody and tell them make the most of your time and live god called you to live you say well I, it, you just don't know how hard you're not the only somebody got a burden you're not the only somebody that sometimes can't go to sleep at night come on talk to me you're not only somebody that has somebody close to you that's in a storm, or you're not only somebody that had a tremendous loss, but you've got to understand what God said to Israel. While you're in the bad place, make the most of your time. The late Mrs. Gertley Bell couldn't see at all. You, won't, you wouldn't meet anybody more persistent I believe to do the will of God. She said, Reverend Schubert, I can't see, but I know how to dial those numbers. I've been calling these people, say, how y'all doing? <laughs> oh, she was hilariously wonderful. She couldn't see, but she could still talk. So she could call and witness to people and pray for them in her blind state. Cause she decided I can make the most of my time where I am right now. And she was believing God to give her a miracle and give her sight back, but she went to glory before she got sight. But she did fail to talk about how she called to encourage people and to pray. Let me go to the next thing. The second thing God said to them, until your change comes, Put your trust in what God says. Put your trust in what God says, not in what others say. God said to Israel, uh, this is perhaps Judah, you'll be in Babylon 70 years. The false preacher Hananiah said you'll be there two years. Boy, that sounds good. Seven is a whole lot more than two. Now, I must confess, Nelly, if it's seven or two, I want the two. Just like everybody else in here. And Dietrich said, amen. 
But when God says 70, how many of you know he doesn't mean two? And when God says 70, he doesn't mean seven. Because God is specific with what he does and he does not error. So the prophet Jeremiah reminded God's children, no, you need to trust in what God has said to you and go ahead and live the way God has told you to live. Go ahead and get married. Go ahead and build your house. Go ahead and give your daughters in marriage. Multiply while you're in Babylon because God can bless you no matter where you are. Some people think they got to get to a certain place for God to bless them. God's blessing you right now. But God can increase you right where you are. I mean, you know that's true. Just raise your hand and witness. God can bless you no matter where you are. You can be on the mountain, you can be in the valley, you can be in, in, in the projects, you can be wherever you are. He's in the projects? Oh, you got a doctor that came out the project. He's practicing in West Virginia right now. It doesn't matter where you are. God can bless you wherever you are. He's greater than what anything, any circumstance, any condition. So Jeremiah reminded them the word of God is what you trust. In biblical and church history, God's word has always been challenged, debated, and doubted. Challenged, debated, and doubted. Because there are always people who are smarter than God. Somebody just shouts, stupid, <laughs> stupid, <laughs> foolishness. You know, listen, this happened in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3. When Eve sinned, she didn't just go out and eat of the tree that God told her not to eat from. That serpent came. We call him the slew-footed devil. He came and said, you know, God didn't say you can eat. And God knows if you eat. Your eyes gonna come open and you're gonna know the difference between uh, good and bad, uh, good and evil. You, it's all right for you to eat. Now, no matter how subtle it is, the children of God must put their trust in God rather than listening to the subtleness or the cleverness of the enemy. It's happening again right now. God's word is under attack, being challenged, even by those who supposedly are in the church. Now, what kind of foolishness is that? You're going to read in one passage and say, I'm going to believe in Jesus and be saved. And then you're going to read in the next passage. And then you're going to come away and say, well, but I, there is no hell. Even not. Jesus talked about hell. Or you're going to read in one passage about the sexuality that God approves and ordained. And then you're going to read another passage and say, well, they did that or that. Did God bless it? Did God ordain it? Did God say it was good? Did God say it was all right? And the answer to all of the above is no. And then they say, well, I, I read that God's word is on the attack. Well, marriage is between who? Well, in, in the Bible, the only marriage you have in the Bible is between a man and a woman. Did you know there are no same-sex couples in the Bible? You said, Reverend Shuman, this is the 21st century, and this is the Bible. We live in America, and America is always doing something that's inconsistent to the Word of God. Don't you remember when you were told you were just a part of a man or a person? Don't you remember that you were told you were not equal? Don't you remember how you were treated? That was never consistent with the word of God. And so let's not get all intellectually ignorant. That's a real oxymoron. But we're so smart, we're doing ignorant things in defense of that which cannot be defended. 
Jeremiah says to them, I know what Hananiah said, but this is the word of God. You will not be in Babylon two years. You will be there 70 years, and it's up to you to trust in the word of God. I like the song we were taught as little children. The B-I-B-L-E, come on, help me. That's the what? The book for me, I put my trust in the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. It doesn't matter what the law says. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what the highest ranking official says or the highest court. I put my trust in the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Whenever people say something that's contrary to that, I'm not going with that. How about you? Until your change comes, you should still be trusted in the word of God. Man, everybody, somebody said to me, everybody else is doing it. <laughs> what kind of answer is that for a child of God? The Bible tells you that broad is the way that leads to destruction and many people are going that way. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And Jesus said there are few people that find it. Turn to somebody and tell them don't go the way of the world because they always got us outnumbered. This is not about, this is not about uh, who has the greatest number. This is about who will trust in the word of God. And you see examples over and over in the Bible of people who came up challenging and debating and doubting what God says. And in every case, not some cases, but in how many? In every case, they lost. God will not change what God has said. God actually said to Balaam, now, this, is, this was a man who, who was a prophet who just went wrong. He started, you know, they, they offered him some money. And the Bible says the love of money is what? The root of all evils. They offered Balaam, the king offered Balaam some money and said, what I want you to do, Balaam, this is in the book of Numbers, I want you to go over and I want you to curse the children of Israel. Whew. That's dumb. That's what Rip Jones said. She said it. But you're right, I'm with you. That's so dumb. How are you going to curse something or somebody that God has decided to bless? Turn to somebody tell them, don't waste your time with that foolishness. And he got over that. At first, you know, it's the, it's the most hilarious story uh, and dramatic story and perhaps the most uh, atypical story you're going to get in Scripture because he's riding a donkey and God didn't want him. God was trying to protect this preacher. The preacher got foolish too. And so he's riding along and God put an angel in the road and it's a narrow road and the angel has a sword drawn and the donkey sees the angel and the sword and the preacher did. So the donkey turned into the ditch, <laughs> into the wall and uh, Balaam said, what is wrong with you? And he hits his donkey and said, you get up and go. And the donkey starts again and that angel is standing out there with that sword. And so it says he pressed up against the wall, you know, and it kind of mess, I guess, uh, mess Balaam's leg, and, and, and he hit that donkey again, got back up, trying to get there, because the man offered him some money. Isn't it sorry? Took the bribe to curse the children of God. And the third time, this is the part you really like. The donkey just turned around and said, why you keep hitting me? <laughs> I mean, God is somebody. That, he, he turned, the donkey turns around and says, man, why you keep hitting me like that? I just want, I wonder what kind of voice he had. Maybe he had a big boy. Why you keep hitting me? <laughs> 
Can you imagine what Balaam is doing right about now? And he said, don't you see the angel in the road with the sword in his hand? So why do you keep beating me? And this dummy, they offered him money, still tried to curse the children of God. And every time he opened his mouth, God made his words come out as blessings. You know, whatever God does, you just got to say thank you, Jesus. God knows what God is doing. God knows what the word of God is. And the children of God are just jump up and shout because whatever God has said, that's what God meant. And he says in that passage, God is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should repent. Whatever God has said, God means it and he's going to do it. It might take 70 years, but God is going to do it. So put your trust in the word of God until your change comes. Now here's the third thing, the third and final thing. And this is the one that has made uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 a remembered chapter. They don't usually get the first two things. They usually get this part. Remember that God is for your good, not against you at all. In verse 11, God said to his children, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to bless you not to harm you. In God somebody. Plans to prosper you and to give you a future. In other words, God says, I'm for you. I'm never against you. Somebody lift your hand and tell him thank you. Now I know there are things that happen in life and you don't understand, but you better understand this. God is for you. God is never against you. If God's against you, how are you going to make it? If God's trying to do you in, you would be dead already. If God doesn't want you to go forward, guess what you're going to do? You're going to stay where you are and go backward. But God says, no, I know the plans that I have for you. I plan to bless you. I plan to prosper you. I plan Just got to wait for it to happen. Hallelujah. God was saying to them, I'm still your God. He was saying to them, I'm still working for your good. How many of you believe God is working for your good? You know, you some, sometimes, you know, you don't, you don't get well when you think you ought to get well. Yeah, I know. But God's not against you. It will be for me, Rev. Schubert. Why I got to go through all this? Because you live in a world of sin and there are penalties for sin. There are consequences for sin. There will always be sickness until Jesus comes because of sin. There will always be death because of sin until Jesus comes. There will always be some difficult time because we live in the world that's filled with sin and God has declared there will be death. Jesus says it this way, in the world, you will have trouble in the gospel, but I like, he didn't leave it right there. He said, in the world, you will have trouble. Turn to somebody and tell them, I got to go through something. Sometime, I'm, I'm gonna have to face something sometime, but Jesus didn't end the verse or the sentence there. He said, but be a good cheer because I have overcome the world. Somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. I got to go through something, but I got the Lord Almighty on my side. And because he has overcome, that means I can overcome. And because he has defeated them, that means I can live in victory. And because he has triumphed, you can triumph. God says to them, I'm still working 
for you. That's a very comforting word. He says, you're in exile for 70 years, but I'm still working for you. I was asking the friends, how, how, how are you making it? They said, I'm making it on grace. He said, I'm making it on grace. Now that's an answer there. Say, I'm making it by the grace of God. Say, I gotta face it, but every day he gives me more grace. Say, I'm going through, but I'm making it by grace. My load is heavy, but I'm making it by his grace. Wow. What a testimony. I understand God is still on our side. Somebody said, I, I, I don't know why God is doing me like this. Well, number one, God not doing you. Hello? God's not doing you. Where we get this kind of theology that God's doing this to me? Mm -mm. Turn to somebody and tell them, come on over in the New Testament. You don't see God doing it to the children of God. Now you can live in the Old Testament if you wish, but I like this New Testament. Because in the New Testament, you don't see God doing anything to his children except blessing them and forgiving them and rescuing them and talking to them and comforting them and encouraging them and bringing them out and healing their bodies. You don't see God doing anything to them. And Jeremiah said that Israel, you're in Babylon 70 years, but while you're there, God is planning to bless you. He's going to do it. And so until your change comes, what are we going to do? We're going to make the most of our time. Except if what you want to change right now isn't changing, everybody shout, make the most of your time. Yeah, live for the kingdom. And if until it changes, what do you do? Put your trust in the word of God. You trust God for what God has said in the Bible. The meteorologist is accurate sometimes. Maybe most times. But he's not accurate all the time. She's not accurate all the time. There have been times the meteorologist said this was going, it was going to rain. And I was just as dry as I could be, sitting out on a fishing bank. So thank you, Lord, for holding the rain. Yeah, I thank him when I'm trying to fish now. I don't care about the rain at other times, but I thank him when I'm trying to fish and it's not raining. Hmm? The meteorologist is excellent sometimes and accurate sometimes. And we want, I, 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 I watch now. I've already checked out this week. I said, oh yeah. I like that temperature going up. I hope he's right. Because I said, maybe I could get fishing a few hours in one day. I want it to go up just because I don't like it being as cold as it is, but I make the most of my time. I just put on enough clothes. Mm -hmm. Somebody say, man, you can't fish now, it's too cold for you. Mm -hmm. Should have been with me a few weeks ago when I had on two sweatshirts and a jacket <laughs> and caught this six pound bass. You should have been with me. You do whatever you want to do. I said, I'm gonna make the most of the time when I have a chance. You gotta live it out. You can't just talk it. She be I just don't feel how many times you think I haven't felt like preaching on Sunday morning? You don't have enough limbs and organs probably to count them and bones heap. You make the most of your time and you put your trust in the word of God and you remember 
God is always purposing to bless you. Stand to your feet. Father, I thank you right now that you have always purposed to bless us. There is never a second, never a day, never a week, a month, a year, not even a moment when you're not blessing us. And so for those of us who want change and for those of us who are waiting for something to change in our lives, maybe our health, maybe to be healed in our bodies, maybe for advancement in the career or profession that we're in, maybe to get through a period of bereavement, maybe to see someone we love change their ways and serve you and be saved. Maybe, oh God, waiting for you to turn our adversary around and make them for us rather than against us. Whatever we're waiting for, help us to live out what you told your children in Jeremiah 29. We thank you that you've given us life. We thank you that we're still in our right minds. We thank you that there's health and strength in our bodies. We thank you that whether we're in the sanctuary or unlisted by one of the outlets, you are for us. And because we're listening, we thank you right now that you're still using us. Perhaps some have become more seniorly and can't do what they used to do, but help them to realize what they're supposed to do now, even according to your word, imparting wisdom to the younger, helping them to develop more as Christians, pass it on their experiences, pass it on their faith, oh God, transmitting the words of scripture to the younger folks and their families so that they too would grow up one day and declare, uh, my mom, my dad's God is my God and, and Jesus is my savior. The word is my standard. In Jesus' name. Amen. While you're standing, if you are unsaved, there's a good day to be saved. There's always a great day to be saved. The Bible says, God said, the day that you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. So if you need to be saved, there's always a great day to be saved. Whenever you believe God is saying, be saved. If it's you today, please accept him right now. The doors of the church are open. Give your life to Jesus. Whether you're in the sanctuary or whether you're listening through one of the outlets. If he's talking to you, you know it. If it's on your mind, that means he's talking to you. Would you be saved today? And if you're joining the church, I'm inviting you to come. You are saved, but you say, I, I do need a place to call my church and to help serve the Lord there and be faithful because in the Bible there were no persons going off with their individual uh, places to do their own things. The church is a congregation, faithful believers, where the pure word of God is preached, where the sacraments are administered, and where the children of God major in the things of God to advance the Lord's kingdom. If you're present today, would you come? And if you're listening, somebody is by the phone, 334-265-9361. 334-265-9361. You can put it in the chat box if, box if you're on Facebook. Thank you. You may be seated. Let me thank you for being in worship today. Please remember that the ushers and stewards are uh, in positions as you exit uh, to receive your tithes and offerings. I want to encourage you to teach your children to pay the tithes and offerings. Teach them now so that when you give them money, 
parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, and, and the rest. Teach them to pay their tithes now. If it becomes a, a, a practice now, probably be that much easier later. And teach them as, uh, not just to pay their tithes, but teach them God promised to reward them and he never changed that passage. So that what they give, they can expect God to bless them back. There are a few announcements. Our guest present today, I don't have any guest cards today. It's cold outside, but I'm real warm. How about you? I always say this, I'm quite cognizant of it. I don't think we need to be like sports fans. I think sports fans need to be like us. But there is something I like about sports fans. When they are true sports fans, they are true sports fans. Cold, rain, sleet, snow. They still go. I saw a gentleman at Carver High School when I was there for a parents meeting this past week. Proudly wearing, what's that, the blue and, and gold, Brother Stoudemire, the Michigan color. I said, do you really have to wear that? One of the teachers. He said, yeah, now nah, I got to wear this now. Because I was born in Detroit. I got to wear this. I said, you should wear it, man. You earned it. Sports fan. But today, or yesterday, it was freezing in Baltimore. How many of you watched the game? Mm -hmm. About seven or eight of us, ten of us, okay. Oh, something in the bathroom. You folk were cheering like it was 95 degrees. <laughs> and I was too. The little bit that I saw of Lamar Jackson, I was at a function, a 90th birthday function. But you know, these smartphones are wonderful. You put your Bluetooth on, you can listen. You hit that watch button. I wouldn't do that when I saw I'd just check it out every now and then. Posted my score, and I was cheering for Baltimore. Now, they were freezing. I was warm. They're fans. I just wish the church would always be like fans in that respect. Showing up for Jesus and cheering regardless. There's a play next week, Just as on Trial, and our youth, we bought tickets for all of our youth to go, so if there's a youth in your family, they can receive a free ticket to Just as on Trial, which will be at the Davis Theater next Sunday at 6 o'clock, uh, and will feature uh, witness, the witnesses of Emmett T. Omega Evers and Harriet Tubman, I think. We've got a prayer, a church-wide prayer session. Uh, it's on January the 30th. You'll get it again in your email. It's Mount Zion's prayer session from the Evangelism Committee. I'm asking every member to make sure you're logged in. You won't have to pray, but you can agree in prayer. And the Bible teaches us something about the power of agreement. That one person can chase a thousand demons, but two persons can chase 10,000. The power of agreement. Isn't that something? That's big. So uh, we can get much done in prayer. Some things we can only get done in prayer. Now, Alabama State has nine weeks. It's called Suzuki Brass for children. Uh, ages four and up, and it's only $99. So uh, we, we have flyers for that if you want to teach your children how to play an instrument. Uh, Suzuki Brass from Alabama State is nine weeks, 
and it's ninety-nine dollars. I've got grandchildren too, so you know I like to see them on an instrument. Suzuki brass, and Alabama State also has piano lessons uh, for beginners, ages six to twelve. And the spring session begins on January 29th. Let me see, I didn't, uh, the Suzuki brass session begins February the 12th, but the piano lessons for beginners begins on January 29th. Now I have the flyer that has all the information and you can get one at the office after worship. And the piano lessons cost is not listed uh, on the flyer, all right? And lastly, we're getting close to what America calls Black History Month. And so in celebration of that, uh, everybody can get a Black History bookmarker. It's free, because you're, you're just so wonderful. You, you can get a Black History bookmark, and I've got on my Black History bracelet. A wonderful person told me, I got one on both arms, on both wrists, somebody said, it's not black history. I said, it's always black history. Do you see me? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Just because America celebrates it one month out of the year, we ought to celebrate it. Come on, talk to me. Every month in the year, we are black history. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And the bracelet is free to so take one for you and for your uh, the members of Mount Zion, okay? And if you're a guest today, you take one too because we're glad you're here with us. All right, and we, you can start wearing them now. You don't have to wait the next month. You can, I'm wearing mine, I just think I'm gonna wear mine the rest of the year. Since they came in last week, I just figure I need to say more about what God has done. And for folks to ask, what is that? That'll give me the opportunity to give a black history lesson. Amen? Amen. You can't do too much. I think we also have pencils, uh, maybe. Is that right, Miss Patty? We don't have pencils. I will get some pencils for the children. Uh, some black history pencils this week. All right, God bless you. We have a big funeral on Saturday, as you know, for uh, Elnora Bain. Some of you don't know that. Some people who are new or haven't seen her, she's been incapacitated for a few years with several conditions. But for my first 25 years at Mount Zion, she decorated everything you saw in the sanctuary. And whenever we had an extra event, I called Sister Elnora Bain. We finally came to a point for our conference events when I could say to her, now I can pay you. So put a price on it and give me an invoice. And whatever your charge is, you're going to be paid. You see, you do what? Until your change comes, you'll be faithful. Not always going to get paid for everything. I still don't. But you be faithful. And Bishop McCoy looked at me, the late, and said, you mean to say, you all hauled all those tables and chairs to the YMCA? I said, yes, sir. He said, you will never do it again. Go find a place that will hold the banquet and the conference has to pay for it. You should be moving chairs and tables. I, I was good, glad to hug him that day. Because we had just worn out ourselves. Yes, ma'am. You received an email from the church from me concerning Reverend Sandra Ware's second oldest sister, uh, Pat Smith. And so I hope you brought an offering that some have already given and we gave that offering for those who've already given. We've already given what you have given. We gave it to Reverend Ware, I think on Friday of last week, but her sister's home burned completely. They lost everything. Is that enough said? They lost everything. So you'll respond 
as you are able to respond with your best gifts uh, for the ministry of kindness. Now you please note, uh, just put, if you put where on there, we'll know that that's for the fire, or you can put fire, and we'll know it's for the fire. All right? God bless you. Let's pray. Bless our tithes and offerings that we gladly bring to you this day. Thank you for allowing us to go out, to work, to be employed, some to retire, others on their way to retirement, some with good inheritances. We thank you for however you bless us. And we're willing not just able to give out of what you blessed us with into your house for the purposes for which you have indicated in the word of God. Today we pray especially for Patricia that you cause her to recover everything that she's lost and then some. And may she have all the more reason to turn to you and give thanks, to worship you, to get up and scream with a loud voice like the children of Judah when you declare the battle is not yours but the Lord's. I give you thanks. Now, may grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God who is our Father, from Christ Jesus who is our Savior, and from the Holy Spirit who is our Helper both now and always. Amen. I don't think I said the funeral service is Saturday at 11 o'clock and the first convocation for Alabama, Florida begins Thursday night. Thank you. Thank you for viewing this Mount Zion AME Zion Church worship experience. We hope it has been a blessing to you and we can be contacted at 455 West Fred D. Gray Avenue, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104, or by phone at 334-265-9361. Good afternoon and Thank you for spending a moment with me today. Uh, I want to share something with you concerning 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Now this is written, I'm reading from the King James Version or the New King James Version. Listen to this. I heard it first in the King James, so I'll read it from the King James Version. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap up themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now we're living in a time where almost anything goes. I want to call your attention back to the Word of God, and I've got several Bibles here. Uh, I'm not even particular now which one of the Bibles you would use as long as you understand that there is sound doctrine in the Word of God. There are laws that are being passed. There are customs and traditions that have been in place. Uh, people are doing all kinds of new things. I want to challenge you as a child of God to find whatever it is that's new and see whether or not it's substantiated or declared by the Word of God. If it isn't, be very, very careful 
uh, that you don't error in your faith because the Lord Jesus Christ has called us as the body of Christ to be his ambassadors. So we are to speak for him that which he has declared. And so just for a moment every day, I want you to spend time in the word of God because this represents and is sound doctrine for us. We need it, we can't live without it, and we're going to go farther and farther into the darkness and the chaos that we're seeing right now without this word. That's Claude A. Shuford in Mount Zion. Just a little note for you today.